Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Coming to us from the Fast System, now coming out with its second Compendium volume, which managed to get funded in 33 minutes. Congratulations for that. The Thank one you. and only, the art of the game, Scott Taylor. How are you doing today, man? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm making things work, so we're having a good day. Yep. Thank you for, wor thank you for working with me and in, in our... Um, insane schedules on bo on both ends given the <laughs> given some of the right, right. Ones we had on that front um, <laughs> it is a rare case where time zones weren't the problem just a whole lot of other things lining up being the problem <laughs> right right um, but we made it happen so we're good so you're coming off the you're coming off a successful volume one compendium now going into a second installment in this compendium series when it comes to the when it comes to it i'll start with the fact that did you always have the idea of doing multiple volumes planned for these compendiums or was it something where you realized there was a bunch of material that got cut from the first one that would have to go in a second what i what i realized um when you make a when you make an rpg from scratch um especially one that's multi-genre mm -hmm. um you're always going to have um opportunities to expand that um so when i did compendium one i knew that there was going to be other opportunities to do other compendiums um because you know obviously this is a game that i'm constantly playing um on a weekly basis to make sure that I can hit as many genres as I possibly can. So what the compendiums kind of do um, is allow me to expand on something that I've played um, and had more um, tabletop experience with directly on how that affects fast as the core system. Mm -hmm. um, so you're always going to see more of these compendiums um, until maybe I can do like a, a fast core gold, like a big book that puts it all together. But I want to make sure that um, I have enough compendiums that I've, I've looked at enough different genres. Uh, this one you see uh, that I'm doing has a lot more to do with uh, superhero role play. Um, it has to do more with some tech role play. Um, and, uh, so it just, it expands on those things. And I've also, I always get feedback from my players, um, not, the, not even the, not necessarily the players I play with. I mean, certainly they give me feedback, but also the people that are playing the game in the wild. Um, and they'll say, this is what I do. Uh, this is what works for my group. Um, how does that work with your system? And on, on my, uh, uh, discord, they'll come in and they'll talk about it. So, uh, and then I'll give him my feedback as a designer on this is why I did it this way, but this is how I see it working in the system, whatever you're doing. So I like to put in a lot of those alternate rules, too, that I think that are helping people play in their game. Uh, and that comes out in the compendiums. Yeah. Now, since you're since we're dealing with supers, that, of course, is a very, very wide net to cast. And one of the, yeah. there's multiple bullet points that I'd want that I'd want to get into in regards to this. And the first one is the idea of utilizing CCV or character casting value in yep. non-magic games. So what 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 exactly would that entail? Are we dealing or is it a case where this is where psionics would come into play? Is it a case where this is where a superpower system would come into play? What is meant with this idea of using casting value in games that don't use magic? Okay, this is what I found um, in playing, and it had, uh, a, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, was um, he was playing a fast version of Star Frontiers, um, and one of the things they saw in Star Frontiers, when not using psionics, let's say, which are were added later in that system, but if you're using just the base system of Star Frontiers, uh, you know, with your with your four races or whatever, and you're it's very high tech. Um, what you find in the game, the way that the fast core is built, there are three archetypes. 
Um, and the academic archetype leans heavily into CCV, which means one of their primary builds is giving them access to a lot of CCV that allows them to cast spells. And most things that you can find are going to have psionics, which use CCV, uh, or magic, or stuff like that. But in a strictly tech uh, or modern system that doesn't have spells, um, one of the things that, that they found was the archetype for academic uh, is hindered because they're built to have more CCV. But if you don't have CCV in your game, why build an academic character? Um, so because that's one of their primary assets. So one of the things I wanted to do when I went in and looked at it was say, OK, um, if you're if you're in a non magic system, those CCV will be utilized. They're actually transferred over into the ability to use them. Um, kind of in a, a, a two to one, I think, uh, viability for faded points, which means an academic character all, all of a sudden um, becomes luckier, basically, because they have the ability to make things happen to keep them alive. And so instead of using CCV to throw magical spells, fireballs, or psionic abilities, they're bending fate um, to say that even though they're uh, like Evie in The Mummy, uh, she has no necessarily skills to, you know, allow her to do things. But if people are shooting at her or something like that, um, she could use those things to nullify certain attacks or something like that, using them as faded points. So that's one of the things I saw with the academic system that I had some concerns or complaints about, like, hey, this is a real hindrance if we're not using uh, a magical uh, setting. So that's that's how that that's a rule that came about through play. And it made a lot of sense. Like, I don't want people not to play academics because all of a sudden the ccv is meaningless to them uh, so i gave them a way to put that into their system if they're not using magic in the system so it's essentially weaponized luck yeah yeah i mean that's what faded points are in the first place and everybody gets faded points but you're limited you know and once you use them they're kind of out until you slowly build them back up through adventuring um but in this standpoint each adventure, you get a little more luck, basically, to, to modify those roles if need be. And and fan points are a big deal in the game um, to sway dirt, uh, certain circumstances. So it, it, it makes it very helpful to be an academic uh, in a non-magic setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can... I can certainly get that. Yeah. And with... Now, with that in, with that in mind... You're updating the faded traits list, including a bunch of new ones. Obviously, asking you to go through right. 37 new right. traits would be a bit excessive. So, what would right. be a few highlights as far as new tr as far as new traits that you happen to be um, fond of or you thought turned out really well? Well, first thing you have to understand, faded traits. Now, faded traits. When I initially did the core system, I had 20 of them. Um, and I, when I did the core system, the fast core, the reason it's called fast is because I, I wanted everything to be streamlined and you get to do everything quickly. Um, but one thing is I found when I was looking at the system, it's like it's like feats in D&D. You don't want too many of them because you're looking at different books or whatever. But you do find certain settings that might apply or might have a faded trait to it. Like um, one of the faded traits that I liked and, and uh, one of my uh, another game master liked, I, I did... Uh, a faded trait um, called uh, nearly naked defense. And the reason I put that in the game was I was looking at a lot of different settings. Uh, one of the settings you might find would be anime, right? Where you're looking at something uh, like an old school anime, like uh, the dirty pair or something like that, where these girls run around and they don't have much on, but they're blowing stuff up and nobody can seemingly hit them. Or you look at a campaign like Conan, at least in the Conan Barbarian movies, and you know he's just walking around in a loincloth, uh, but he doesn't get hit. Um, so that is one of the things that I was looking at, uh, kind of, uh, genre specific or setting specific. And as I went through and did different things like crawl, um, or starship troopers, as I looked at just different settings and obviously I'm not utilizing those settings, but I know that if somebody is out there trying to convert something over, wants to play in a setting like those, um, you're going to have faded traits that are going to come, uh, that, that would be perfect for those settings. Uh, I did one, uh, you know, one of the things, and not many people play, well, not many people I don't think play heroes, um, and I don't think many people play spy, uh, but one of the things I did was super spy, um, which basically if you see Bond or somebody out there, they can seemingly, if they pick up a shotgun, they can use it. They get on a boat, they drive it better than everybody else. They get in a car, they drive it better, they get on a plane, they they can, you know, 
uh, undo a bomb. Or and you're like, well, well, I'll never have enough skills to do that. So I put in a faded trait that basically, uh, in the game, if you try to do something called a naked skill deck, the max you can ever get is three. And this allows you to get a four and a five, which means you're pretty much 50% of the time, uh, if you're a high-level super spy, you can do anything if you really had to. You get at least get that roll, and you could use a faded point, a faded point system to, to even make that roll happen. So um, those are the kind of specifics that I wanted to put in. And so as a caveat, when I did these 37 new traits, I, I put it to the to the game master. I'm saying this is the game master section. If you see something in here you like or want to allow the players to use, they can. Um, uh, but again, that's up to you. It's not in the core book. It's not the core faded trait system. Those are all pretty good. But I did update some of those that I found through two and a half years of play um, might be underpowered. Um, where they needed to kind of grow with the character. That's one of the things that I saw was was character growth. Like if I get a plus one at first level, is that really worth me taking that uh, versus like a seventh level trait or something like that? Mm. Um, so I, I had it where they started growing with you. So it, when you if you take it at zero level or first, whatever, it's plus one. But at third, which is one of my benchmarks, you get plus two. And at seventh, you get plus three. So that makes it a huge difference at plus three at seventh level. you grow, The skill grows with you. The faded trait go, grows with you. So I wanted to do that for a lot of things. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of what I'm talking about there mm -hmm. with with the faded traits. Yeah, and I can I can when it comes to the whole feet thing, since you brought that up, um, yeah. I do th I do think it's I do think it's amusing because um, I've seen people swing the pendulum to, um, both ways. I've always yeah. I've always been of the I've always been of the belief that the while the issue, while the issue of having too many feats was was certainly a problem in in say D and D third edition, there was one Pathfinder, big, yeah, yeah, there was one <laughs> yeah. bigger problem yeah. that I don't think a lot of people addressed around that time, or if they did address, they overcorrected, and that was the um, prerequisite problem, the what's been called the feat tax yeah. and what I call pay not to suck, like all the stuff you yeah. had to do just to do proper dual wielding. Um, and right. of course, Whirlwind Attack was always my whipping boy for that concept, especially when I've got one of my players who's a big Zelda fan, and obviously the spinning attack has been standard fare in the Zelda games since A Link to the Past, so right. they'd want to bring that in, and it's a little hard to do that when you have so much stuff that you need to do in order to get Whirlwind Attack. Right. I mean, that it, it's that's the double edged sword with feeds, uh, it, you know, because when I initially did the system, I had whirlwind attack in there as one of the primaries so you had to be seventh level to get it. That was the, the caveat, right? Seventh level. If you make it seventh level, you can choose it. But what I was finding was um, because at seventh level, you get a faded trait in any uh, any category, be that academic um, combat or social. And you would find somebody who wasn't necessarily good with a weapon and never really been good with a weapon, but be like, oh, even though I'm an academic, I'm going to take this um, because I can get any at seventh level. That's the caveat. Um, where it was kind of something where you could go outside your skill level, but I wanted people to be thoughtful about it. Well, depending on players necessarily to be thoughtful can, can be a problematic because a lot of times they'll power game it. Um, so I had to kind of go back and say, okay, I'm not going to put in a huge list of stuff you're going to get, but you're going to need to have some kind of weapons mastery to get that, you know, yeah. uh, on top of the seven yeah. you, you need to be able to use a weapon well. You can't just roll up and have whirlwind attack. So there's a little of that, um, but I wanted to shy away from it as much as possible, like you're saying, making a huge tree where you're just... Like, if you don't start that tree at first level, you'll never get there kind of thing because you had to predetermine it. Um, but, yeah, so that's that not point, the case with my system. If you're predetermining yeah, it, you're not you're not really making the choice. It's a false choice um, situation. Yes. Yeah. And you're never really playing the character. You're playing power gaming to get to something that you know will make your character more yeah. epic. You know, and that's... Yeah. Go ahead. I, bring, I, often, I often dive into those kind of things because... I think a lot. I think a lot of people are only um, only looking at part of the part of the symptoms and not the cause. Like, yeah, yeah. Power game. Power gaming is is certainly an issue, but I think a lot of people overcorrect and not examine why people are power gaming. Right. Uh, and 
One of the other ones that I, f I find kind of interesting is the fact that w one optional thing is counting up instead of down for skill targets, which reminds me of right. the, de the endless debate about ascending or descending AC that mm. I'm pretty sure is still raging on. I just haven't paid attention to it. Right. The one thing I wanted to do with fast, um, I, I, you know, when I said it, when I, when I talked about it, I was like, I, I don't want to be here to be the roadblock for you playing or your players enjoying it. Right. Um, and, and almost instantly, um, once fast was released, people came in and said, my players like to go up instead of down. Um, and I said, that's fine if that's what you're doing. And a lot of people had different ways that they were going to do that. Um, so at the end of the day, I, I just said to myself, look, I'm not going to be a roadblock for people. I want you to enjoy the system the way you want to enjoy it and the way the players want to enjoy it. And mechanically, it really doesn't make any difference which way you do it. It, it just doesn't in, in the way I, the system is. It's just whatever you prefer. So I wanted to put in, in this compendium to the rule set, in my opinion, of the best way you can do counting up instead of counting down, both on the ability to uh, in combat or just in base skill use. Obviously, skills are used in combat, but um, in skill use, you go opposed. So, um, that, that, so that's just up or down. So I just wanted to have those rules in there for people to see if they wanted to do it. It's not the way I play it in my system. Uh, at least in combat, I always go down. But I have seen the need for um, just people mentally kind of fe feeling better about going up and having targets. Um, uh, you know, I need a 12, I need a 15, I need a 20 um, versus, you know, you need an eight or less and they roll a nine or are very upset about it. And it's like, well, your percentages are still the same. <laughs> yeah. But for some reason, you don't like the fact that you blew it on an eight, nine or 10. Um, but so it, it's which, whichever you like uh, and whatever you prefer. But I, like I said, I just want people to have it out there. Uh, know that I'm fully behind whatever you want to do. And my system works either way. Uh, it's not going to change um, the mechanic, but it might change your experience and your player's enjoyment. And that's great. That's what we want. So that's why it's there. Mm -hmm. And for for what it's worth, I've experimented with doing kind with doing kind of a blackjack like approach that's mid that's midway between aim high and aim low. Um, yeah. And the the reason I call it that is because one, I'm I was a big fan of the, I was and still am a big fan of the victory point system in Fading Suns, which operates similarly. The idea is victory you're aiming point, low, yeah. but you're trying to get as close to the line as possible. Right. Right. You know, like much like how in Blackjack you're trying to get as close to twenty one as you can without going to the hundred percent, yeah. And in do in doing that I I put in the rule of Okay, okay, that technically succeeds, but you can try and do a raise, roll another d10, add it, and see and um, see if you get a better result. Right. Which, on one on one hand, you on one hand it means you might get closer to the to the line. On the other hand, you might blow it. <laughs> bust, yeah. You might bust, and you're done. Yeah. I like giving my players risk reward, so that so that um, it so that it turns a dice roll into kind of a game of chicken. Because at any point they can back right. off. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I like that. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. It's just, a, and with some games that I've used that I've I've done that so that I could do instead of doing two separate rolls for both attack and damage, I could um, do it as one. You know, you right. roll to see if you hit, then you well, then that roll also determines how well you hit. Uh, now. You also talk about expanding the healing skill. What? What? Um, were there were there some remarks that that people felt the healing skill was underutilized, or what? What prompted um, well, focusing on that? One of the things that I looked at when you're looking at the healing skill is uh, basically the ability of somebody that has it to to be a field medic, um, but it it was it was very unlimited. Um, which means a field medic, let's say there are eight people in your party, and, and then they had skilled surgeon, which is a, a faded trait you could get, which allows you to heal two wounds instead of one. Mm -hmm. Like that person could roll seven times um, very quickly and heal everyone for two wounds. <laughs> um, 
And what I found with that was it becomes problematic if somebody wants to try to break the system on it. So uh, the new healing skill expanded basically um, does, it, it initiates time limits. So for every wound that is healed, it takes 10 minutes of treatment, field treatment. Um, and you only have a certain amount of time typically to uh, heal heal people. So that means as a, as a surgeon uh, or a field medic, you have to pick and choose. You can't just willy nilly, you know, just start healing everybody and just be done every single encounter um, because healing six people would take you 60 minutes for one wound each. Uh, and basically that I, a golden hour, which is kind of something that's used in Savage Worlds, that's the time that you have to do it. Otherwise, the body clots itself. You're not really going to have as much of an effect. Um, so you basically have that time, that more to work with. So um, that's I just wanted to clarify that because I saw some breakage in the system using that school using that skill, especially if you had a skilled surgeon, to really just become a, even a better healer than, let's say, a cleric who is limited by their CCV. You're just doing it uh, constantly, so it needed to have some kind of breaks put on it to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. Still does the same thing, but you, you just can't use it without some kind of consequence, I guess. Yeah. Which that is certainly that is certainly understandable. Um, yeah. The now to f- to kind of follow up on um, sk- on skills, you also talk you also right. talk about a skill synergy system. What's that right. going to entail? Well, uh, I mean, there's skill utilization, which I just wanted to go in and, and say, if I'm using criminal, what can I use that for? And then I put in a bunch of examples of uh, if you're using it to play cards, this is how it's used. And I did that with a lot of skills that I think were more ambiguous. Uh, Obviously, driving is driving, right, for the most part. But there are some skills that were like performance might be a little different or influence might be a little different. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I just wanted to talk about that. And then I also put in a system where uh, you get a synergy bonus. If if I have influence and performance, they give a synergy bonus um to that skill um because they both kind of reflect off of each other and make you better uh, as an overall performer or an overall you know influencing person so there i it's very simple but something like you would see in let's say like a shadow run system or something like that where um skills can correspond with one another and maybe give you some kind of advantage to that and in the and then the next part of it, which is the, the true score versus raw score, um, I had to put that in and, and those add directly to that um, that aspect. So you have kind of more ability to build that skill. Mm-hmm. That, cer- that certainly makes sense. Yep. So contin- continuing on from, from that, um, you all... Oh, the- I do want to shift a little bit into the combat end of things because you're talking about doing things about adding things in like multiple attacks and right. re- and um, redefining several aspects, including cinematic mass combat. So yeah, what what sort well, of major changes would be at would be ha- coming to the combat system? Well, the combat system um, it ended up being. Um, Again, you look at the way gamers see something, right? And uh, kind of an advantage versus a disadvantage. Why would I use a short sword when I could use a long sword? And um, what is the advantage to using a short sword? Really, there's nothing. Uh, It does less damage, and it's not going to help me. I mean, unless you're just doing something that's specifically playing a character, and that's what they use, um, people are going to look at that. And also, when I did the initial system, I had heavy, like using a claymore or something like that you would only get one attack every two. So I already had the mechanic in it to kind of limit people using those things. But I felt like I needed to have, um, I needed to give some advantages to using light weapons. Because light weapons, uh, because my system uses a wound threshold, and let's say your wound threshold is 10, a light weapon can only do 10. I mean, it could be modified higher than that, but it only gets 1d10. So typically it's going to be very hard for a light weapon to hurt somebody like that unless you're pushing all the time. Um, so one of the things that I, I found is, well, at least I get two attacks. I might get a better chance to, to do a critical. Uh, one of those one of those attacks might be a 9 or 10 or whatever I need to roll to bump it up past 10 and do damage. Um, so I wanted to give them a little more oomph. Um, so basically it, it, it does that. And then another thing that I was looking at in the system, especially when playing a lot of um, science fiction or modern, um, was the effect of why could you 
get two attacks with a short sword, but I can't pull the trigger on a gun or a laser twice. Um, so I had to look at that and how modern weapons uh, apply in the game. And so basically all modern weapons that are semi-automatic um, have the ability, no matter basically what they're, um, if they're light or medium, get two attacks. Um, so I had to put that in. So there was a lot that had to do with it. That A lot of that came out of this, this Star Frontier system role of tests. Um, and also tests in High Garen City, which we played, uh, which is like the 1920s. And I, I'd had Burst, and I'd had a fully auto. I had those things involved. They have their own mechanic. But just giving people extra attacks with those lighter weapons and also makes it um, a lot more deadly in those systems because you... It, it, I use, in the game, I call it the, the Sam Colt rule, where, uh, you know, um, God, God made man, man but, but Sam, Sam Colt, Colt made them equal. But, exactly. So it, it makes, if you just give some mope a gun... That he can pull the trigger twice and do two d ten each time, it's dangerous. Like you don't want them to have those guns. So um, it made it a lot more dangerous uh, <laughs> in the aspect of guns, uh, which I liked. I think it played well in the system. Um, so that that's I call it the same Colt rule, and that's why you get multiple attacks with with those things. But I think it made sense throughout. And then I had to uh, adjudicate some faded traits involved in it as well because all those were geared to a single attack and i had to make sure that uh, anything that came that might have messed with attacks in general once that rule came in had to be adjusted as well and then uh the cinematic mass combat i played a lot of um starship troopers uh um setting kind of thing where you're fighting just bugs everywhere and and a lot of that dealt with um the cinematic mass combat running from place to place just shooting as many things as you can um, and when I did that, I, there was so much um, just test play with it that it, it, it allowed me to trim down the system um, and streamline it even more um, and kind of give my opinions of how to run it as a GM to make it more cinematic and uh, have it resolve faster and, and, and how you do that. So. And, I, and I've, I've put up some of those examples in my YouTube channel. If you, I, I show, um, we role play uh, a, a fast version of Middle Earth. Um, and there's some some cinematic mass combats in there that are, are pretty intriguing. Um, so you can see the way that it kind of boils down with these new systems and how I redefine them. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, since we you did talk about um soup about leaning into supers and i'm guessing this is right. where things like heroic recovery defense and power costs comes into Gosh. play yeah i mean you know superheroes are tough um i i try when i did the fast core system i think there are 20 um superpowers um and you think 20 that's nothing um but but as in everything fast they compartmentalize and each power has several levels to it. So um, it, it does cover a lot, um, but it, it doesn't cover everything because there's just so many things that can happen in, in superheroes. But one of the things I found out uh, during play um, is that um, typically in, in a hero system, you don't have a healer. There's no cleric. Um, and, and unless you're playing, some, you know, like a Marvel version with Night Nurse or you know something like that, you're not really having somebody who can heal your characters during the course of combat. But but often when you see uh, when you read comics or you see a movie in comics and you see the the main character, the main uh, hero is like down and out, and then all of a sudden they just summon something from inside themselves and get back up, right? Um, but afterwards, if it's Batman, you know, he has to be like. Alfred, I need you, you know, and they passes out one of those things. So, so you see those things, uh, and this just gives the ability of heroes that I saw to put themselves on the line a little bit more, get some wounds back for a, a certain amount of time, and then kind of pass out and have to be helped and recover for several days. Um, heroic defense, uh, that, that was put into play because we had a lot of situations where uh, there were innocents that were around, and a lot of times you'll see uh, heroes like, oh no, you know, these three kids are going to crush by a building falling on them, but, you know, I, I can't necessarily get to them um, uh, unless some some super thing happens. So it allows you the ability to, to have movement or stuff like that to try to save people. And uh, it, I go into um, 
just give a, a better definition of, of superhero power costs. And also one of my favorite things that I did was uh, the, the swapping of faded traits for superpowers, which means instead of building a superpowered character, I'm taking those superpower points and I'm turning them into faded traits. And you'd say, well, why would you want to do that? And I'd say, well, the primary example would be a Marvel character like Punisher, right? So you look at him, you're like, he's not a superhero. Uh, but no matter what I did in building a character within the mechanics of fast, I could never get all the skills he has. Um, because he can quick reload and, you know, he's great with all these weapons and all this stuff. And um, so one of the things you could do is basically you're swapping out superpowers for more faded traits to build a combat or some other kind of character that's just really, really better than everyone else. So really they are a superhero. They just don't have superpowers. And I thought that was very important to put in the game because people are going to want to build those type of characters. I've got a, a character that we play that you can see online um, in my superhero setting uh, called Ar Argentine Azul. And she uses double pistols. And uh, But she's basically a secret agent, but she's just better than any other secret agent. Like as a child, she was just better. You know, she could just pick up stuff faster. Not necessarily like Taskmaster better, but just had the ability to learn things better. So that's why she's got all these skills that, she would not have at third level or whatever because she's taking her super power points and putting them into data traits. So, mm -hmm. um, and then yeah. anti hero points is one of the because what I found was playing superheroes, people get irritated, players get irritated or do things that aren't really heroic. Like, um, we had a guy who you know could could drain uh, energy off of people, and he was like upset about something. And you're like, I'm just going to drain this guy and get his get hit the height that his power is. You can drain him and actually take their wounds and give them to yourself, but you kill them in the process. Well, that's not a very heroic thing to do to kill people. And we had another guy who was a robot, and he would he didn't he said he didn't understand the concept of not killing someone with his blades when he ran by it was combat what are you supposed to do but it's like if you do that you're going to get these anti-hero points and eventually after a certain number i think 10 yeah. anti-hero points awarded by the gm i get your character he's just going to be an he or she's going to be an npc and they've just turned evil they're they're yeah. too out there friends they're not really heroes but you would, i didn't really think you'd have to do that in a hero campaign but you do but only way you find that stuff out is play it you know, so that's why the companions are so important because I'm playing this and I'm seeing the problems that come up and I'm addressing them for yeah. players. The only the thing, GMs. yeah, the only thing I'd note is it's important is it's important to make to make sure that you, that um the distribution of hero points and anti-hero points doesn't result in uh in what I've called the paladin problem. The paladin problem right. well, being, no, the, being it, the fall or die situation. Yeah, That's I mean there are no something. hero points, so so at least at least you're not getting anything for being too good. You're just being a hero. You don't get you only get anti-hero points in this system. Yeah. That's just don't be bad uh, yeah, if it's... you can help it. Uh, yeah. But we we've we've all seen we've all seen per firsthand or seen stories of that GM who puts the paladin in a situation where they either die or do or do something that violates their tenets and become a black guard. Right. That's that's just being a jerk. Yeah, if, if they're really that determined, yeah. Which is, in which my is opinion. why, which is, they which is why they're referred to as that GM, much in the same way that <laughs> you've probably heard the running meme of yeah. that guy. Right. We all, we yeah. all know yeah. that guy. We've all had to that deal with guy. that guy. We all hate that guy, yeah. even if sometimes that guy is not a guy, but everybody knows that yeah. guy. That guy, hundred percent. And and one of the things I tell the GM is. There could be a campaign where a character specifically has to sell drugs for some reason, or d even do drugs or something. And, and normally you'd get anti-hero points for that, but that's something that the character was built toward. So keep that in mind. There might be situations you have to be flexible. Especially I mean, if you're dealing with this more is street level heroes that are, are going to yeah. lean into Shades of Grey. Right. 100%. So maybe they'll pick up something here or there for something over the top uh, than normal, but you know, roughing up a, a, you know, an informant or something like that. Maybe they get away with that because they're more of a daredevil type, um, you know, where Captain America probably wouldn't do it. You know, it's, so you have to kind of, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Um, and use, you know, use them accordingly, you know, kind of the thing. And then I go into a a big spiel about making super suits, which I just thought needed to be addressed because they're complex and people wonder how to do it. Uh, so I, I had a conversation actually back and forth on text 
um, with a player and I was explaining it to him and I just took the entire conversation and kind of encapsulated it. And these are the questions that came up. Let me just go through it. You can see kind of how you can walk your way through it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And given that, given that in the sense you when I think it's, I think it's important to know where the line is drawn when it comes to super suits. I'm assuming that right. we're talking about characters who get their powers from their suits. This is, whether it be exactly. Iron Man, Iron, whether it be Iron Night, Man, Night yeah. Thrasher, right. whether it be whether it be right. war, whether it be War Machine or a mm. un, even even um I'd say even Giver, even though, even though that's more biological sure. and mechanical. Sure. I did it. Yeah, that's a good that's a good 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 call there. Yeah. Yeah, I want I wanted to yeah, make that call because it, I didn't want um to give off the impression that anyone using a super suit is automatically cribbing from Iron Man. Right, right, for sure, and it's a good example. Um, you know, Blue Beetle, um, you know, something like that. I mean, any of those characters, you know, and there are a lot of them that you're going to find. And somebody's probably going to want to be a super suit uh, a hero, and uh, this just gives you a much better understanding of how to use your super power points um, to to do that. And it's basically um, kind of. Uh, there, there's a there's a superhero uh, trait which allows you to you know up a skill higher than normal and that's basically upping your um, engineering higher than normal where most people are locked at not, you can't go above nine but these people are just so bright you know be they Tony Stark or whatever they can build it or or you can find a suit and build it that way outside of the um, the network but this is how you build it you use these points uh, to to build the suit and then in, then increase the power of the suit as you go up in levels um and however you explain that be the the guyver suit gets a new ability or something you know uh biologically or uh you know the the uh, the, the, the beetle you know uh, comes up with something different i mean there's always different ways to do it but i just wanted to explain it because i knew it was going to come into play at some point even though we don't we're not currently in a campaign with super suits i know it's going to be somebody's question so i just wanted to address it if like I said, this compendium is addressing a lot of issues with superhero games, so let's let's go in and talk about it. So that brings me to one particular question that I've seen a lot of superhero games either struggle with or you have to go into a ridiculous amount of math when it comes to setting setting it up. And that yeah. is form switching when it comes to suits. Um, obvious, obviously, there's plenty of examples in Common Rider that I could point to, but since I brought up Iron Man, I'll bring up do you remember season two of the Iron Man cartoon back in the 90s? How the <laughs> armor had a bunch of different forms for different types of environment? Well, I mean, I, I read Iron Man uh, as a kid, so I know he had the stealth suit, the space suit. Is that what you're talking about specifically, where he was building yeah. different suits? Um, but, yeah. He, there was that in the in the, in the the second season of the cartoon. There, the You had essentially form switching of that base suit. Right, um, different mo different modes he could assume based on the situation. Yeah, so um, one of the things I addressed in there was was kind of like um, I had to go into the old adage of, of "Look, life isn't fair," right? <laughs> and a lot of players, uh, mechanically, especially when you're talking about something like balance, want everything to be fair. Uh, and I I just had to come out and say, "Look, I mean, sometimes life isn't fair." Uh, I, I think that superpowered characters, especially those with the ability to actually modify their suit or build different things, are going to, at the end of the day, have a little bit more oomph um, than a regular quote unquote superhero, just in the aspect of their ability to switch or build different things. Mm -hmm. There's still a limiting factor in it. Um, you still can only know what you know and build in what you know, but you can. You can modify or have different suits to do different things, along, assuming you have the the knowledge, the time, and the money um, to to do that. And you know, obviously, Tony Stark, if we're using that as an example, is a would be the the high end, hmm. let's say, uh, of what you could do. So it's like saying, I want to play a superhero game, but I want to play Superman. Most GMs aren't going to let you play Superman. It's just you know, because all you can really do is throw kryptonite at him. Um, so they kind of break the system. You'd rather have more moderately powered superheroes or street level superheroes, even. Um, I, and I, so, 
the, the point would be don't break the system on superpowers. But yes, if you switch stuff in and out or have modifications of suits or have different suits, that can be done, but it's expensive, it's time consuming, and, and you're limited by what you know as an engineer or a builder. Yeah. Now, since you brought up the idea of piloting and wounds for mecha as well as vehicles, yeah. that's an interesting yeah. one because I have seen some games that try and integrate mecha, but they end, but the mechs in question end up just being a vehicle with ex with one ex with a different coat of paint, and I've always been, I've always had some debates about whether or not that fits the fantasy of when someone wants to be a mech pilot. Right. Well, I mean, you know, when I lived when I was young, uh, and I lived in Indiana, northern Indiana, I. I would get up every morning uh, at like uh, 7, 7.30 and get downstairs uh, and uh, turn on the v VHS so I could record Robotech out of WGN in, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And and I've just, I've loved mechs ever since. I, I never stopped. So it was something important to me, but it was also something that I looked at if you watch something like Star Wars and you see the Millennium Falcon or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> and I wanted to put in... Uh, the aspects of just why Rick Hunter or Roy Foker or, you know, even for that, my Han Solo or somebody is better than, than, than your normal person uh, in a mech. And, and that was um, the piloting wise, they're going to be as limited by their skill. If they're good, they're good. But as a player character, you get to add your wounds of the player character to the wounds of the, the thing you are, be it a vehicle, if you're Mad Max to your car, to your, you know, if you're, you know, if you're, Roy Foker to your to your Veritech, or you know even in the case of um, Han Solo to, to Millennium Falcon and Chewbacca would have, and and one of the things else it's always like is there anything worse if you watch a lot of war movies or something like that that you're on a transport or something and it gets hit and everybody dies <laughs> there can be anything worse than that like you're ready to go to battle and but you don't even make it um, and that is a horrible TPK opportunity for um, a game in which like all the players load into a Karelian class you know transport to go someplace and a TIE fighter blows it up and you lose all your characters. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to put in was as long as all the characters in, the, in there, in the aspect of keeping the damn thing from blowing up, even in a heady combat situation, they all get to add their wounds because they're all helping in some way. R2 is trying to get the, you know, the, the light drive going, you know, it's just any of those things, you know, somebody's, somebody's, you know, jumps in the, the guns. Um, so that is the standpoint of it. So it's why it makes player characters or in this, in the case of my game faded uh, characters better quote unquote, than, than your normal Joe in those mecha or, you know, piloting whatever. So, um, so wedge Antilles would just be better in his um, X wing than, than, than your normal TIE fighter pilot. Because he's at if he's faded, he would be adding his his wounds, which might be four or five, to a medium X wing, which might only have two wounds. All of a sudden, it's got seven. Well, it's going to last a lot longer in a in a mass combat situation or a combat where a lot of damage is getting thrown around because he can just do it. So that is the way I address that in there uh, in the system, and I just wanted to get in further into it so people understood um, better how to utilize uh, vehicles, uh, be they mecha, be they you know. Uh, cars or whatever I and mean, it just gives a little more survivability and a little more uh making sense i think um so yeah that's one of the things we play tested a lot we did a star wars play test and fast and, and found yeah. that was uh, exceptionally useful and so yeah given given the given that particular play test um yeah there's a, there is a part of me that wonders if somebody who's probably playing a jedi because that was inevitable um, sure. Yeah. Had yeah, it, one, had yeah. um, asked about integrating the lightsaber forms into um, oh my gosh yeah. into into so, fast. <laughs> so it's really interesting, and I if anybody really wants lightsaber forms in fast, uh, the person who was running it, I wasn't actually running, I was playing it, um, and a friend of mine was running it because he's a huge Star Wars fan big into the lore and all that stuff and he did every single stinking lightsaber form and, and actually it was funny because the person who was playing the, the jedi could really care less and you know he's like just give me a lightsaber i want to swing around and, and my friend who was running it was like oh you can choose this or this or this and he completely didn't care but it was funny but all those forms were in there uh in his notes uh in those notes 
you could have them if you want. I'll just give them to you for free, obviously. Can't charge because I don't, you know, don't obviously own any rights to that. Um, but if you'd like to see what he did with those forms, yeah, I mean, they're super extensive. Uh, and it just, there, I mean, there are a ton of them. Uh, you know, could who wants to fight like Dooku? What form did he use? You know, it just, form so two. anyway, it was. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, he, that, you're like him. Like he knew them all. Like off the top of his head, he could give you them all. I, I love Star Wars, but I'm not that into Jedi. So um, hmm. nevertheless, it was it was a lot of fun to see him do it. Um, and uh, all those forms were created for fast. Uh, so again, just send me a note on Discord or something. I'd be happy to send you his notes on them. They're quite extensive, like I said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you, and you can modify them accordingly. But yeah, and anyway, it does work. And yeah. For, for me, it's it's not ju it's not just about the lore aspect, but also, um, I will I will always I will always lean in favor of giving of giving uh, martial characters options because I do think in a lot of yeah. games in general and a lot of fantasy games in particular, <coughs> um, martial characters end up getting the short end of the stick. Uh, as opposed to casters in, in some, especially in fantasy gaming, there's this idea that you shouldn't be, that you should be, that martial characters should be some one trick pony, which I've never vibed with at all. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the, I, I've always seen the juxtaposition of you need the fighter to keep the mage alive until six, and then after six, <laughs> you need the mage to keep the fighter alive when they start throwing fireballs, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a flipped switch there, where the fighter just becomes nothing but a hit point soaker uh, for the cool things that your casters are doing. Yeah, I mean, you see that a lot. And the so yeah, I, me, I agree that it would be nice. The reason this is a bit of a problem is um, consider consider this scenario. Let's say somebody yep. is a bit. Let's say somebody was a big fan of um, Zoro. I'll use that as an example. Okay. Perfect. And, Beautiful. Yeah. But whether it be whether it be the whether it be the black and white um, TV show from decades ago or the Banderas movies, doesn't matter. But okay. they they're but they want to do something that's more of an XP of that, doing a lot of that yep. swashbuckling style, a lot of. Parries, repasts, economy of motion, all of that kind of stuff. So imagine right. how deflating it is for them when they get when they have all of that set up in their mind on how they're going to play this character, and mechanically they're told basic attack. Right, roll your d10, and that's what you get. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, okay. So it's there are two things that I see involved in something like that. Mm -hmm. um, a well, if you're using fast. Um, which I highly recommend. <laughs> if you're using fast as the GM, you need to read one of those books, watch one of the movies, or or invest some time in in understanding um, fencing uh, or dueling or anything like that, and then uh, create your own small network of uh, faded faded traits or kits, even that I use in the system that says like I'm a Spanish duelist. I use these particular styles, and you just get that at first level, and you and you get a little more variance. Uh, that would be the easiest way to do it um, versus creating, like, let's say, the lightsaber tree uh, in Star Wars where everything has a big write-up of three levels and, and this and that. Uh, the only negative would be um, that I would see is if um, somehow it extended um, the combat round of the attacker to the point of annoying other characters. Yeah, um, the, that's that's the caveat. You don't want them to be like completely nuts. On, I'm going to do this and that and this and then this and that. like it, I don't know. If you ever, did you ever play um, uh, Earth Dawn? Yeah. Okay, so Earth Dawn had a series of uh, I don't know if they were forms. I don't know what they were, but but they were just extensive. And it, it was like I, I'm going to start with an air dance, and then I'm going to go to a blade you know, slice, then I'm going to do, and, and everyone have had a different set of dice and every, and there, you could, you could like roll, like tie like seven attack forms together. And it just, by the end of it, it was just like, what are, what is going on here? I mean, I'm, I'm rolling 27 different dice and, and you just took a half an hour to explain to me what you're doing. We finally had to get little cards when we were playing it, and we call, we named those maneuvers. There's one called the Blade Summer Maneuver, I remember off the top of my head. And it had like eight form, or four, maybe let's, say, let's say five forms in it. But we knew if I used the Blade Summer, <laughs> these were the forms and these were my dice. That way we didn't have to explain it every damn time. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what, you don't want it to get there, right? 
but you do want to give more variance to the player and, and have them enjoy it. And if everyone is kind of playing that and enjoying it, if they're all kind of, let's say you're playing three musketeers and you're all a musketeer and they all have different forms, then it might be kind of fun. But if you have one person sitting around who's like, yeah. for me, you know, for me, it's, a bard, then maybe they're not gonna... For me, it's more of that narrative. It's more of, um, I, I reject that narrative of fighters aren't supposed to be powerful kind of thing. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Or the or I've I've seen cases in playtests of um of certain games where the moment that the fighter gets some degree of options, the caster players start screeching about how it's in about how it's making things too superhero. Right. Uh, or yeah. one in one case, somebody said it was adding quote anime BS. Yeah. Oh. Well, again, that, that's judging your table, I guess, or the players that you're playing with. Some people are going to have those problems, but you know, I, I agree with you. I would like to see a better option. I mean, I'm a fighter at heart uh, as a player. That The first character I ever had was a fighter um, and love armor. Um, and I, So it's dear to my heart. I like to see fighters have the ability to do stuff and not feel like they're limited. Yeah, I just um, want I just want as many people to do as mu- to do um, an appropriate amount amount of stuff so that they feel like they're doing the class fi- the for lack of a better term class fantasy. Yeah, yeah. That's all. That's also so, why I rem- I remember when I had a with one of my early um, adventures, I had somebody who was doing the ranger archetype, and I told I told him, don't think don't think legless, think Rambo. And since both of us had seen Rambo go. First Blood, he, fig- he sure. figured it out. Oh, yeah, I like that. Rangers have had a um, tumultuous history, <laughs> mostly because sure. okay. it's kind of hard to do an outdoorsy kind of character in games where you're going to be spending so much time in dungeons. Right. Oh, right. It's not the, you had the same problem with the Cavalier. It's kind of hard to do that when you're indoors, and Cavalier's big right. thing is being on a horse. Hundred percent, love the Cavalier, but no use for him. Like when when he's on a horse, yeah, I mean, just yeah. I think I cheated sure. at one point by giving some by giving a Cavalier a basically a basically a motorcycle that he could um, summon. <clears throat> nice, yeah. And I think they kind of did that in third edition. There's like Phantom Horse. I mean, you, you could, I guess, if you really wanted to, but you're limited by the size of the room too. If you're pulling that crap up, but, yeah, yeah. Anyway, which is what, which is yeah. Why I mean, with, a miniature option. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I, and again, that's one of the, my favorite things um, to do within the construct of the fast system because it's multi genre is to look at the books on my shelf, be they novels or be they RPGs uh, or even, you know, collections of movies or whatever you had and say, I really like that. Um, what if we just, you know, played four sessions in it and and uh, you know we developed anything that might be special to that setting like uh, you know if you're beastmaster you want to play a beastmaster game for four so you know that somebody's got the ability to to work with animals in some fashion or, you know I mean, any of those kind of things and you just have the ability to do it and kind of make it your own uh, and uh the base system i feel like the fast core system that i've created uh once you once you conceptually understand it uh between light medium and heavy um, and how everything is based on those the light and you know, heavy system, you can very quickly start to modify things to the nature that, that makes them easy for you. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. And I love your idea of, of like a Zorro or, or you know heavy leaning into swashbuckling in some fashion. Mm-hmm. I think would be a lot of fun. Yeah, especially since you you talked you talked about um about that sort of naked armor concept that's pretty much what you what you have there or with characters like say John Wick you know where he where right right where he's wearing a suit you know and you got yeah there's no defense but he has you know he would have some kind of ability like that yeah yeah so yeah it just makes sense to me i mean because obviously we watch a lot of cinema or something like that and these characters are done to be visually appealing to us be it him in a suit not wearing you know a bpv or whatever or you know to to red sonia or to anybody what whatever case you see that doesn't make sense i mean if you read robert howard you know typically kind has like a chain shirt on or something but if you watch the movie uh with schwarzenegger he's just running around you know and uh, you know nothing so 
you want to try to help explain that, I guess, to a certain way. So that's why I put in stuff like that, just so conceptually, it's kind of funny. And if you don't take it as, you take it kind of tongue in cheek, right? It's not supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be fun. Um, so again, that's that's why I did something like that and put those in there. And there's a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. One of my mantras in the temple is believability over realism. I.e., make um make me believe in the same way that that you may recall the po the tagline for the first Superman movie back in the '70s was "You will believe that a man can fly." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And that's kind. Yeah. That's kind of the um, principle that I've that I've, ta that I've taken with this. Now, yeah, well, it's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that with that said, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the Compendium Volume Two? It's going to be somewhere close to the first one. I think that one came in somewhere close to 40 pages, so it's nothing huge. Um, you know, it's just a small supplement filled with a lot of cool stuff that I think a GM could use. Uh, I, you know, I never go for any big, uh, you know, overblown things. Again, the FAST system is supposed to be very easy to use um, with a lot of a lot of stuff that should be easily accessed. Um, so it should be right around the same Um and that's the way I'm going to shoot for all the compendiums. And that way, if I get, you know, three or four of them and I'm happy with those and, um, you know, and I put them into a, a big, you know, fast um, core gold or something, uh, you know, that that book would come in, you know, maybe 300 pages, which I think a lot of people like big hardcover mm -hmm. 300 pages like they're getting they're getting their money's worth kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, it'll be the same size, uh, basically, as not only my setting books. Um, my gamelytic age. I'm hoping one well, gamelytic age might be a little bigger, um, but um, mm -hmm. these these supplements, these compendiums, will be about the same size, I think forty pages roughly. Yeah. And I and um, as far as the release window, not a date per se, but a ballpark. What are you shooting? For? Right. Well, well, I mean, this this is the hindrance that I'm currently under. So it's written. Um, the artwork, the artwork is mostly done. The cover is obviously done. Um, so really, it's about just laying it out. But uh, I, for that, I have a partner um, who I've worked with for ten years, who's excellent in all my stuff. But he's had a very tough year, so he's just behind on everything. So I'm really at, at the mercy of him. The stuff is done. I just have to wait for it to be laid out. Um, I think the first compendium I had out like in a month um, from from the date, um, and you don't think we're probably looking at that, but we'll, we'll see it sometime in the fall. I would hope. Um, once he starts catching up with the stuff he has, he's still, uh, I think, you know, he's still working on Gamalytic, and then he's got a little mini adventure for me, and then uh, um, I think full, uh, Folio Black Label number ten, and then he'd have this. So anyway, it's it's there. Uh, and the nice part about these is, um, other than you know the artwork, and obviously the words are different, but there's a formula to it. Um, well, let's say Gamalytic Age is like he had to lay that out completely differently. Uh, this he's already got compendium one, so he knows exactly how it's going to go, right? Um, so, well, it, it should just go in uh, very easily. So that's what that's the hope, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to it. But with that <laughs> said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. <laughs> It's always a blast. I love talking to you. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!